Thousands of Egyptian protesters storm the headquarters of the state security service and demand the organization be abolished. The agency is accused of widespread human rights abuses and torturing its own citizens. So why is a security apparatus so feared and hated? And what role could it play in the new post-revolution Egypt? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Darren Jordan. Three weeks after President Hosni Mubarak's ousting, Egyptians are turning their anger towards his internal security apparatus, storming the agency's main headquarters and seizing documents to help build a case that the service was used as a tool of torture and abuse against ordinary Egyptians. The protesters are demanding the agency be dismantled and its leaders face justice. Amin Mohideen has more. Outside the gates of the sprawling state security compound in Cairo, Egyptian soldiers stand guard. This fortified complex was home to the country's most notorious security apparatus. But in the new Egypt, even its iron-clad doors were not enough to keep protesters from overtaking the compound on Saturday evening. Inside, protesters found documents, police records, underground rooms and even a passageway that led to a secret living quarter they claimed was used by the powerful Minister of Interior, now standing trial. They also found bags of shredded documents. With the recent departure of the Mubarak-appointed Prime Minister Ahmed Shafi, protesters feared that state security officials would destroy all evidence that could implicate them. After protesters stormed this massive state security compound behind me, Egypt's new prime minister asked anyone with incriminating evidence or documents to hand them over to the military so that they can be used in the prosecution of former regime officials. Documents like these obtained by Isra Abdel Fattah, who was detained by state security twice for her political activism, show how state security was spying on her, even hacking into her email accounts to find out which organizations she was involved in and who she was in regular contact with. These records show they were extremely paranoid from us. Every piece of information that for us seemed insignificant would be significant for them. They were convinced that there must have been some international organization behind my activities. That sense of paranoia led state security to act with impunity for years, many say. State security officials were often accused of corruption, extortion and torturing activists and citizens alike. Today, on the walls of the abandoned complex that came to symbolize the oppression Egyptians endured under the previous regime, a simple message left behind by the protesters. This is the fate of the oppressors. Ayman Mohideen Al Jazeera, Nasser City. So what's the history behind Egypt's infamous state security service? Well, Egypt was the first Arab state to establish a security service in 1913 under British mandate. It still exists to this day. The Internal Security Service has been accused of some of the worst human rights abuses in order to suppress dissent against Hosni Mubarak's 30-year rule. It's rumored the agency has some 500,000 staff and a large network of informants. The history of torture allegations against the agency has grown since the war on terror was launched after 9-11. The Egyptian government's been accused of turning the country into a torture center for terror suspects and even acknowledged that since 2001, the U.S. government transferred up to 70 detainees to Egypt under extraordinary rendition. Well, to discuss Egypt's state security agency are our guests in Cairo, Hisham Safi Eldin, a former police officer. In Dubai, Theodore Karasik, a director of research at the Institute for Near East and Gulf Military Affairs. And also in Cairo, Hossam El Hamalawi, who's an Egyptian blogger and activist. Gentlemen, welcome to the program. Uh, Hisham Safi Eldin, let me start with you, if I may. Uh, what do you know of the inner workings of the security agency and does it deserve the allegations of torture and abuse? Well, uh, first I have to mention that yes, there was some torture, there are lots of abuses and the whole, the entire sector needs to be reformed or even dissolved into a new mechanism and a new ideology. Uh, the problem is not in, in, the, in, in the system or the state security itself, but in the whole regime, including the Minister of Interior and the state security. State security was turned into a tool in the hand of the regime, in a state to be a tool in the hand of the people to protect themselves and protect their home country. 
So uh, I guess, yes, it, it has turned to be uh, a weapon uh, which is pointed out to the chests of the normal citizens. Yes, this is something wrong. But uh, I need to mention as well that there is a part of this sector which is tackling the anti-terrorism, the counter-terrorism activities, which is a noble part that we need to, to recognize here which is something that relevant to, to the information that they have. And um, I'm very concerned about the disclosure of this imp important information. We have lots of officers that are trying to trace cells outside homelands in different parts of the globe. And they might be in a very vulnerable situation okay. if this uh, information was released. All right, well, we'll come back to the reform. But yes, the I possible. agree that yes. lots of abuses OK, well, we'll come back to the possible reform of the agency uh, a little bit later in the programme. Hossam El Hamalawi uh, in Cairo. We've, uh, we've spoken to you, Hossam, many times uh, during the revolution and afterwards. But let me ask you, uh, why do so many ordinary Egyptians fear uh, and hate the secret police? And how did Mubarak use the agency so successfully uh, to enforce his rule? Um, Egyptians hate state security police for the very obvious reasons, which uh, some of them were mentioned actually by uh, your guest, who's a former police officer, which is uh, state security was a weapon of the Mubarak's dictatorship. Uh, state security uh, rested its essence on the use of torture, systematic torture, not just some rotten apples and police officers, in order to quell and silence dissent of any sort uh, uh, in our society. State security officers acted with impunity whenever it came to anything they wanted to do, whether it's torturing uh, citizens, whether it's seizing property uh, uh, from citizens, whether it's also imposing taxes and royalties and uh, money using thuggery uh, on Egyptian citizens. So no wonder it was widely hated. Um, Hossam, let me just ask a second question very briefly. I mean, because in that earlier report, uh, we saw one woman saying her email account was hacked into. I mean, you're a blogger. Uh, what sort of stories have you been hearing about what the secret police did to people, particularly uh, with emails and phone accounts? Um, the, uh, the National Democratic Party, together with state security police, uh, had trained uh, a group of their... Uh, uh, supporters basically to uh, to pose as uh, bloggers and to pose as citizens on the internet uh, spamming our own accounts with uh, with comments that are uh, pro-regime uh, trying to down our sites on occasions and trying to hack our Facebook pages and our uh, uh, Twitter accounts but I would say largely they failed they weren't that successful uh, Theodore Karasik in Dubai. Um, yeah. Hossam El Hamalawi seems to be saying that uh, there was endemic abuse uh, and corruption within the service. What's your assessment um, of Egypt's uh, state security system and why is it so loathed and hated by many ordinary Egyptians? Well, uh, clearly Egypt's uh, state security service, uh, this was functioning under a basically a totalitarian rule and it was uh, in charge of actually trying to disrupt any part of society that would challenge the regime. I think it's important here to look at other countries that had similar regimes and what happened to their state security services. Uh, they also, uh, for example, in the Soviet Union or maybe in Romania or countries like this, when those regimes collapsed, uh, the state security police were actually uh, uh, criticized quite a bit for the old order, and that's exactly what's ongoing today in Egypt. Uh, Hisham Safi Eldon, uh, back in Cairo, uh, many people say uh, that it was state security agents that used violence to try and stop the protests uh, in Tahrir Square. Um, how much did Mubarak try and use the agency to help quell the rebellion, do you think? Well, the agency is a tool like any other tool. It, c it could be misused if it was in the wrong hands. That doesn't mean the tool itself it was a, a bad thing, or I can't, uh, I can't say this, because lots of good people were there. However, yes, it was used by the regime of Mubarak in different uh, places that they shouldn't. And I don't agree, of course, with what, uh, what they were doing in this. But we are talking now about the symptoms of the, the, the problem, but not the, the root cause that caused this problem. I mean, uh, you ha we have to, to make it straight that the emergency law, the emergency law, only the emergency law, give them a free hand to go beyond limit and to do things that they shouldn't have even think about doing this. So this is the part that we need to think about when we talk, when we talk reform. 
So this is a good part to start with. We need to end the emergency status. Second, the whole, the whole tool or the whole uh, uh, state security sector was just serving and protecting the regime. And another part of it, parallel to this, was the honest people on the, regime, on the, uh, on the sector that was fighting the terrorism activities and extremism. We need to recognize those people. And I hear from this place calling the Supreme Council and the, the, the managerial uh, uh, rulers of Egypt right now to declare the innocence or the guilt, the guiltness of, uh, of uh, the commanders and the, the leaders of the state security just to let the other people, the innocent people, continue serving these countries. And I also wondering why it wasn't just being put under uh, the supervision of the state of uh, uh, the in, uh, intelligence sector or the judicial system or even the supreme council why they didn't by day one of the revolution okay they secure the information and if, if they are following a crisis management plan or if they are uh, following any uh, contingency plans they should have thought about securing this information because this is the information that will condemn people with corruption and will okay. set people free for being innocent and will protect officers who are trying to do their part, their noble part, protecting the whole globe, not only our country, fighting terrorism. Um, Hossam El Hamalawi uh, in Cairo. I mean, Hisham Eldin seems to be saying there that uh, much of that information uh, should be protected because we saw over the weekend people break into the offices of state security. I mean, should the protesters, do you think, uh, have done this? And how dangerous is this likely to be uh, to, the, to the general security of Egypt? Well, I have to respond to a point that Mr. Hisham is raising about counterterrorism. Uh, let's not forget that uh, the militancy that these Islamist groups uh, have embraced came after they were tortured by state security uh, police. The torture that were systematic by agents uh, uh, and that was practiced under interrogations, it's what pushed those young activists into militancy to start with. Secondly, the whole terror uh, scare was exaggerated very much by state security police and, and by the regime itself in order to justify their own presence and in order to justify the emergency law. I think that the state and the regime are the biggest terrorists, actually, that we had here in Egypt. And I will not applaud the so-called efforts of the counterterrorism police, which were involved in some of the most gruesome uh, uh, abuses during our dirty war uh, in the 1990s. And yes, I do think that this information should go public. I think any information maybe regarding the private lives of activists, if it was mentioned, those documents should be protected. But any sort of abuse, any name of any agent who dealt with this torturing machine must be exposed publicly. Uh, Theodore Karasik, uh, that's an important point yes. um, that um, Hossam El Hamalawi makes. I mean, what sort of evidence and information do you think is likely to be found uh, of the inner workings of the agency, of possible abuse, mm -hmm. uh, particularly against dissidents and organizations like the Muslim Brotherhood, perhaps? Mm -hmm. I think this is a treasure trove uh, because any state security apparatus keeps very meticulous notes and so on. I think it's very important uh, to realize that activists had to go into state security buildings and to draw attention to the fact that the records are still there. Uh, there needs to be an effort made by the current government uh, to safeguard uh, these documents so that they can be used in the future, but also so that particular records that are relevant to uh, something that is maybe ongoing, like in the counterterrorism fight or something like this, uh, that does not involve torture, but that is in the current period, uh, probably needs to be safeguarded as well as uh, personal information. So I think this needs to be thought out a little bit. Yeah, I mean, that's an important point you make, uh, Theodore, because um, Hisham Safi Eldin in Cairo uh, also underlines that point. I mean, many people will say that the counterterrorism part uh, of state security perhaps is serving the country well. So mm -hmm. should that part of it uh, be preserved in the future, do you think? Well, I think that there's, a, I mean, this gets into archival research and so on. I think it is important, and I do take the point that a lot of the activists uh, from uh, the 90s and so on were converted because of torture. Uh, it, that's a very good uh, point. Uh, however, 
there's an ongoing effort that needs to be protected. So when approaching these records, it's about which historical period that you want to look at and up until which date do you want to look at. Uh, do you want to look at it during the 90s or during the 80s or do you want to bring it up to the current point? And I think that's uh, what uh, uh, the authorities need to think about. How are they going to unravel this and present it? Okay, uh, Hisham Safi Eldon, I see you nodding your head there. What's, um, what's your assessment of that? How do you think the documents need to be preserved and analyzed going forward? Well, uh, I, I will start first by, uh, by agreeing with this. I mean, if we have to, to find the, the root cause, we have to go further than the 80s even, even to 70s or even 60s when this whole uh, started, the mechanism itself started. And this will lead me also to comment on uh, what Mr. Mahalawi just mentioned. I agree on one point, I disagree on another point. I agree that there was torture. I agree that torture is unacceptable under any conditions. But no, I have to differentiate between Muslim brotherhoods and some uh, activists or the human rights activists that were submitted to torture. And this is absolutely unacceptable. But on the other hand, we have to think Al-Qaeda and Jihad, Talai al-Fatih, Gish uh, al-Islam, and many other radical and militant groups that I don't think, I don't think at all that they were doing the right thing. And if he forgot, I can remind him with some of their major issues here, like bombing a school in uh, Masra Gidida, Heliopolis uh, neighborhood. It wasn't such a perfect act to do. Or bombing any other neighborhoods, or bombing Wadi Nil Cafe in Tahrir Square. That was a terrorism. That that's something that needs to be fought. All right, listen, I, I, I'm going to bring in back uh, Hossam El Hamalawi in a second, but uh, Hisham, let me stay with you for a minute because I want to ask you uh, a question about timing and the significance of the timing because the storming of the security offices came just as the caretaker, Prime Minister Ahmed Shafiq, resigned. So how significant was the timing of all of this, do you think? Because there are reports that the documents started to be destroyed once Shafiq went. Now, this is one good question because uh, I, I was also... Uh, uh, attracted to the synchronization what what's going to happen I mean the very same synchronization it's happening again it happened with the police station and it's now happening with the state security I mean the state security they had like 25 days or something to to destroy all the evidences why they started to destroy it yesterday only when the demonstrators are trying to enter I mean they have all time to do this this is very weird I mean, there is something wrong. And this information should have been protected from day one again by the Supreme Council, by the judicial system, or even the general prosecutor, the general attorney. He should have done something to do this. All right, well, let's and this um, will lead to another consequences. Okay, well, let's bring the consequence, in... consequence, which is the safety, the concerns about safety and security for the officers and the family of the officers uh, as well. All right, well, let's bring in Hossam El Hamalawi again, just to... Uh, just to talk about that point. I mean, Hossam, is the timing significant here? I mean, it appears that documents started to be destroyed uh, once the, the former prime minister left. Uh, it's not a coincidence. Uh, well, first, we have to be clear. We didn't really know much about what was going on inside those state security facilities uh, following uh, the Friday of anger, January 28th. And that's when uh, the interior ministry pulled its troops uh, uh, off the streets. So maybe actually the destruction of some of those documents had already started by then. But I'm sure that such process accelerated on an unprecedented scale uh, as soon as uh, Prime Minister Shafiq uh, fell. Why? Because state security got totally insecure and uh, they felt that uh, their protection within the regime circles is being eroded bit by bit. So it's not really a coincidence that we will start getting all of those YouTube videos leaked of, uh, of documents being burnt, of uh, state security dumping uh, 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 shredded documents like in garbage bins or getting rid of them. It's not a coincidence. They are insecure. They are on the retreat. They know they are being defeated. So hence, they are acting in a very desperate manner. Um, Theodore Karasik, uh, let me bring you back into the discussion here. I want to widen this out a little bit, if I can. Because according to sure. some of the WikiLeaks cables, Egypt's secret police received training uh, at the FBI facility in Virginia, even as U.S. diplomats compiled allegations of brutality uh, against the service. Mm -hmm. What do you make of those reports, briefly? 
Well, I think that it's very clear that the U.S. and Egypt had a very close uh, relationship between uh, not only their militaries but also with the police uh, officials and uh, particularly with the Ministry of Interior. And that was part of an effort uh, to bring in a more, uh, to bring in more uh, democratic values, if you will, and to make a professional police force. Uh, this is part of what the U.S. Uh, is trying to do. At the same time, in these documents, as you mentioned a moment ago, uh, you're seeing that the embassy was seeing a completely different story. So this, uh, and this is going back to the State Department, obviously, and perhaps circulated to other folks throughout the Washington, D.C. bureaucracy. What you basically have is a couple of different agencies in Washington, D.C. that are trying to achieve certain goals, and sometimes those goals uh, compete against each other. Um, Hisham Safi Eldon, I mean, that's an important point about this, 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 this issue here of the collaboration between uh, the American uh, and the Egyptian um, intelligence and security services. But there are reports uh, compiled by, I think it's Amnesty International, that uh, terror suspects under the extraordinary rendition program were brought to Egypt. They were allegedly tortured. Um, this is something the Egyptian government even acknowledged uh, in 2005, that the U.S. transferred something like b between 60 and 70 uh, detainees to Egypt since 2001. I mean, what have you been hearing? Well, I have to, to, uh, to say that uh, the collaboration between Egypt and the United States is a perfect model that has, has to be followed. I mean, I, I'm not blaming them for handing over some criminals who committed crimes. Those people we are talking about who, are, who have been involved in activities, criminal activities, and it was proving the guiltness of them uh, by planning, conspiring, doing uh, terrorism activities, not only in the region here, but in global uh, uh, perspective. However, uh, those people, I'm, I'm not sure uh, we are talking about the very same people, but uh, those people were mostly condemned in some uh, terrorism activities because uh, the United States government is very keen not to hand uh, any suspe su uh, suspect that might be mistreated or even lead to his death uh, under some torture or something like this. They, they, they can't take this blame. Hassan so, El Hamalawi, let me put that point to you, um, because I saw you uh, shaking your head there. I mean, Amnesty International yes, goes on Yes, that's not a perfect model at all. Yeah. That's not a perfect model at all. I mean, the so-called Western democracies who preach every day like democracy should not support, whether it's financially or militarily, any of the third world dictatorships, let alone the Mubarak's dictatorship. I personally worked on a Human Rights Watch report in 2004, 2005, trying to track down those disappeared suspects in the global gulag run by the U.S. government and which the Egyptian prisons were also part of. The majority of those uh, detainees that were sent to us from abroad on these ghost planes, these detainees, most of them were actually innocent. They just happened to be at the wrong place at the wrong time. And even if they were guilty of committing terror crimes, Definitely the U.S., when shipping them here to Egypt, knew what was going to await them when they arrived here in Cairo. And uh, that did, did not disappoint, actually, the Americans. Those suspects, as soon as they arrived, and many of them were taken to the state security headquarters in Nasr City, which we stormed yesterday because it's so close to the airport. That's why the regime built it there, so as to avoid the downtown traffic okay. when it came to shipping those high price value detainees. So I do not regard this as a perfect model to sum up, and I think that Western governments should stop any sort of dealings with third world dictatorship security services. Okay, Theodore Karasik, let me get a final point from you because we're running out of time. Sure. Um, what's your thought on the issue of extraordinary rendition to Egypt and the collaboration between Egyptian uh, and American intelligence agencies? It was a system that was in place. Uh, I think that it was, as I mentioned before, uh, part of America's outreach. I do agree with the previous speaker that uh, there needs to be a reassessment, if you will, of this type of collaboration. Uh, we are entering a new order where dictatorships are falling by the wayside and uh, regimes that use torture and so on are not going to be tolerated anymore. Okay, gentlemen, we have to leave it there. Thanks to our guests, Hisham Safi Eldon, Theodore Karasik and Hossam El Hamalawi. And thank you so much for joining us here on this edition of Inside Story. We, of course, welcome your comments and your suggestions. Please email them to us at InsideStory at aljazeera.net. And the whole team here, goodbye.